Dying sucks. It's probably the worst thing that can happen to you besides, oh, I don't know, having to watch a sponsor at the beginning of a video essay. Dying in video games, however, well, now that's just a normal Friday night. Because despite what people who spend thousands of dollars on waifus and Genshin Impact want to believe, video game characters aren't real. They can't actually die. And so dying in most games is often just a slight inconvenience more than it is a real problem to deal with. I mean, Isaac Clarke can get all of his limbs torn off, but press continue when it's like it never happened. In GTA, you can skydive from low orbit with no parachute, but your character wakes up in the hospital without a scratch. And in Skyrim, I can reload my last save faster than my character can ragdoll down the side of a mountain. Look at them go. And despite games innovating and adding complexity in a variety of ways, this core part of them has stayed pretty simple. So let's talk about that. So when we talk about a game over in something like Tetris, or the you died message in Dark Souls, or even an instant respawn in something like Super Meat Boy, what we're really talking about is a failure state. This is sort of the all-encompassing developer term for game overs, death screens, or anything like that. And I would know because I never even finished my university game dev degree, so I'm sort of an expert on the subject. Now, the term failure can be incredibly broad here, but I think the easiest way to explain it is that every game has a perfect intended way to play it. And playing the game less than perfect will lead you to be punished by the game in some way. Play it incorrectly enough, and the failure state exists to tell you you've lost, usually before resetting to let you try again. So for example, going back to Tetris, when you place blocks, they stay on the level. If you fail to clear these blocks, they will stack up higher and higher, and miss enough and your tower of blocks will reach the ceiling, triggering the game's failure state, a game over screen that shows you your high score and resets the board. Though, the most common form of failure state in gaming is that of the death screen. Most games give the player some form of health value as a sort of number value in the game's code that's represented to the player through hearts or a health bar or blood in your eyeballs in Call of Duty. And if that health value reaches zero, your character dies, flashing up a message or cutscene before rewinding the game back to some point before you failed. The important thing to note here though is that while Tetris has a game over because you literally would not be able to keep playing past that point, most games with a health bar or other similar failure state make the distinction arbitrarily. In Call of Duty, for example, you could fill those retinas with as much blood as they could handle, but at no point does your health reaching zero mean the game is unplayable. The developers have just decided that at this certain point, you are dead and have to restart. And the reason that this is interesting is that failure states in the majority of modern games work like this. Except for the few times where you might fall into a bottomless pit or something, most of the death screens you'll see are just triggered whenever the devs think you failed enough. You know, getting shot five times in a row is fine, just walk it off, but six gunshot wounds and now you're dead and have to restart. And this core mechanic, being entirely left up to the developer's whims, shines a gigantic spotlight on their intentions for the player. You can see what they value and what they don't just by looking at what gets you to a failure state, and you can see how they want you to play the game. As a clear example, this is actually a great way to determine if, say, an RPG game actually cares about the choices you make. Looking at games like Fallout 4, there are few, if any, ways to just fail the game completely through choices or skill checks. Mind you, I haven't played in a while, but I can't think of anywhere in that game where a bad option leads you to dying or failing a major mission, and even setting all your skills to zero will get you through the campaign just fine. Whereas looking at a game like Disco Elysium, you can literally die in the tutorial due to your own mistakes. If you set your character's health low enough in character creation and fail a skill check at the beginning of the game, you just die of a heart attack trying to grab your tie off a ceiling fan. Yes, that is a real thing that can happen, and it is a failure state 100% tied to the game's focus on RPG mechanics and choices. However, a lot of games don't just trigger failure states when you die. It's actually become an increasingly common trope for a game over screen to pop up even when you just do something the developers don't like. You want to shoot your teammates? Game over. Go out of bounds? Game over. You got too close to the target in one of those dumb trailing missions? Game over. The screen that pops up is the same as if you had died, but now the failure state is just a punishment for doing something you're not supposed to. And while some of these, like going out of bounds or throwing a flashbang at a baby, are pretty obvious why they'd instantly fail a mission, most of the time it just feels like your agency is being taken away. 
Many games get criticized for quote unquote railroading the player, where they make you restart a section if you don't stay on the linear path they set out for you, even in games that otherwise sell themselves on freedom and interactivity with the world. Try to take a different route, mission fail. Try to flank the enemy, mission fail. Attempt to be even slightly creative in your approach in a fucking stealth mission by climbing onto a roof, mission fail. For whatever excuse Rockstar comes up with for you doing anything other than exactly what they want you to do. I mean, most people have at some point played through a game with a forced stealth section, where you instantly fail if you get spotted. Or like I said, one of those Assassin's Creed trailing missions where you have to follow a target from 30 feet back, and if you get too close or too far, you instantly fail. Or any game with an escort quest where if the weak NPC you're guarding dies, you get a game over. Or a timed mission where you instantly die if you don't get somewhere in 5 minutes. Or any mission where you have to rely on the game's AI to do something, and for some reason it's my fucking fault that Big Smoke can't shoot in a straight line. Don't tell me to follow the goddamn train if you can't hit a single target, you high cholesterol fuck. <sighs> These are all pretty unanimously some of the worst types of missions in video games, and all of them use failure states as the tool that they punish the player with. And while a good way to fix these types of missions is to just change or remove them entirely, it's the way they handle failure that's the common link between them. It's often the reason that they feel so frustrating. On this topic in particular, there's a great quote from David Cage, the creator of games like Detroit Become Human and Heavy Rain, where he says, In my games, all women are whores. That's the wrong quote. I've always felt that Game Over is a state of failure more for the game designer than from the player. It's like creating an artificial loop, saying you didn't play the game the way I wanted you to play, so now you're punished and you're going to come back and play it again until you do what I want you to do. And while this might be the only quote from the world's least sexist Frenchman, David Cage, that I ever agree with, it is one that he backs up very well. Every game by David Cage and his studio, Quantic Dream, have been story-focused narrative experiences. You make choices for the characters and engage in limited interactive gameplay moments. But whereas similar titles like The Walking Dead games can have instant game overs if you fail a quick time event or make a really bad choice, Quantic Dream games don't really have explicit failure states at all. If you mess up in those titles, the characters just actually fail to do something, sometimes even leading to their death. But the game continues. And the punishment is not a screen telling you to restart, but a continuation of the story where you live with your failure. If a main character dies, you don't get a second chance. You just have to keep playing without them in the game. And this abstract take on failure states brings up an interesting idea, because there are very few games that do something like this. Imagine if, instead of a game over after failing a trailing mission, you just actually lost the target and whatever information you were trying to get from them, and had to get it from somewhere else. Imagine if your companion dying in an escort quest meant they were just dead forever, and you never got to finish their storyline. Imagine if the developers planned for your failure and made that a part of the game, instead of stopping you the second you went outside their script. This would not only make those previously annoying missions bearable, but actually interesting. You're not rolling your eyes when you have to defend an NPC, you're nervous because you have to actually protect them. There's tension given to the mission just because there's actually a possibility of lasting consequences. And I think everyone can think of at least a few games that do something like this. For example, the one that pops into my mind is Morrowind. And hey, I said it first. I know you were typing up a comment about Morrowind, you fucking nerds, but I said it first which makes me better than you. <laughs> you see, in later games from Bethesda, like Skyrim, the way they handled the fact that you could attack every character in the game was just making the ones tied to a main quest immortal, so you could never accidentally or purposefully kill them and lock yourself out of beating the game. But Chad Morrowind just said, fuck it, if you want to kill an essential NPC, go for it. Then if you do, you just get this message. With this character's death, the thread of prophecy is severed. Restore a saved game to restore the weave of fate, or persist in this doomed world you have created. Which is the coolest shit ever. You've doomed the world, you can't beat the game now, but the game doesn't kick you back to the last checkpoint. It lets you keep playing, it lets you live with the consequences. And speaking of consequences, this brings me to the second big issue with failure states, the punishment for getting one. Now, I've just covered interesting ways to handle player failure outside of death, but what happens if you do actually die? If your character's health does reach zero? 
Well, going back to what I said in the beginning, the punishment for dying in most games is barely an inconvenience, because most games implement a very generous checkpoint system that lets you replay from like 10 feet away from where you died. Some games even implement quick saves, meaning I can spam F5 like it owes me money and then just quick load back to 5 microseconds before I made a mistake and try again which means there are just no consequences for death. The game is telling me it's punishing me for making a mistake by showing a game over, but then the punishment is losing 30 seconds of progress and watching a loading screen. And this is fine in a lot of games. Platformers, for example, utilize this very well by having near instant respawns. Since dying in a lot of harder platformers can be very quick and easy, they just give you the ability to jump right back in without so much as a message on screen, since otherwise you'd be frustrated after your 700th jump into a spiked block. However, horror games and others where death and your fear of it is brought into the experience can suffer a lot from this system. Because if I'm playing a horror game and I get brutally ripped to shreds by a monster just to reload a checkpoint and start the chase over again, that's going to break my immersion immediately. I mean, everyone who plays lots of horror games has gotten that experience of dying over and over again and just not caring about the jump scares or the monsters because you've seen them a hundred times. The lack of consequences for death and the limitations of the monster become apparent and so any fear of them starts to wear off. But if you compare this to something like a roguelike or any game with permadeath, the difference is quite obvious. Take Darkest Dungeon for example. It's a sort of horror RPG game where you recruit heroes and send them into spooky dungeons to fight against monsters and their own sanity. However, the big caveat is that if any of the characters in your party die, they're just dead. It doesn't matter if you've spent hours leveling them or if you've just recruited them, they're gone. And because of that, the tension you get from playing this game is actually real. I actually feel my heart beating through my chest when I'm deep in a dungeon and my characters are low on health. Not even because the game is that scary on its own, its art style and attempts at horror aren't nearly as good as something like Outlast, but because I'm genuinely afraid of losing my party. Though of course, I don't believe that every game should feature permadeath mechanics, because it just doesn't fit in most of them. I mean, if every time Nathan Drake died, I had to restart Uncharted from the beginning, I'd probably game end myself. But I think most games could certainly at least think about how to better implement death and failure. Take Dark Souls, for example. And anyone at home playing the Lextorious Bingo card can now cross off mentions a From Software title. <laughs> Dark Souls, Elden Ring, and FromSoft's entire recent lineup all have death mechanically built into the game. It's kind of the whole selling point. There are physical checkpoints in the form of bonfires you have to find and activate, and when you die, you get sent back to these checkpoints. However, the world persists around your death. You lose your souls in the spot you died in and have to go get them again if you want to use them to level up or buy something. Die again, and you've lost them forever. This form of continuous failure state adds so much to the mechanics of the game. Because death is no longer a safety net that lets you try again from scratch, it's a permanent mark on the world. The game acknowledges that you actually died and pushes you to move past that instead of just resetting you back to before you did. And similar to Dark Souls, you have Sifu, a third person beat em up game where every time you die, your character literally ages. And getting older means your character does get stronger, with your hits dealing more damage, but enemies dealing more damage back to you. Because of your weak ass bones. <laughs> and if you age past a certain threshold, you even become unable to learn certain skills as your character becomes more stuck in their ways. This take on failure gives the game actual permanent changes that stick with you until the end. Fighting a boss with a young character that never died will be fundamentally different to fighting them as an old man. And something that I think is a bit of a misconception about these games is that the change in punishment facilitates a change in difficulty. Because Dark Souls and Sifu are famously hard games, and game designers might be led to believe that implementing failure states the way these games do is something to be left to more difficult titles. But ironically enough, I think their handling of failure states isn't what makes these games difficult. In fact, it can often make them easier. This sort of permanent level system that carries over after death is one of the main reasons roguelikes become less punishing the more you play them. Every death carries over the levels and abilities and items you've unlocked, so going into a run in something like Hades is actually easier the more you failed previously. The game is naturally adjusting the difficulty and letting you have more control over it than if you simply reset from a checkpoint. 
Though, there is one other thing that Souls likes and roguelikes do very well that brings me to my third issue with failure states, which is they integrate the failure into the story of the game. You see, despite death and failure being present in most games, the vast majority of them treat it as an afterthought when it comes to the story, if they acknowledge it at all. Because most games, be it Final Fantasy or Far Cry, do not have it in their script for the player to die. The entire story of their campaigns, surprisingly, does not include any fallbacks for if the main character gets murdered 30 minutes in. So while you can in fact die hundreds of times over in these games before the story is finished, those deaths are treated as entirely non-canon. Which leads to this incredibly strange disconnect between the story and gameplay, something nerds in the internet like me will call ludonarrative dissonance, which I believe is Latin for really pretentious sounding word. My favorite example of this is in Borderlands 2, where the game goes out of its way to explain that death in this world is handled through these things called new you stations that clone you in order to let you resurrect as much as you want. And then not a couple hours later into the story, they kill off a main character without ever acknowledging these immortality machines you've been using the entire time. The game literally expects you to know that these new U stations are not canon to the story, so even though every character has died dozens of times in the gameplay at this point, now it's suddenly permanent because it happened in a cutscene. Which brings up the question, why did you even tell me about these stations in the first place? It's like a reverse Chekhov's gun. Like I put a gun in the table in Act 1, and then in Act 3 I look at the audience and go, I didn't put a gun there, there's no gun, what are you talking about, you're crazy. These two elements of gameplay and story seem like they were written and created entirely separate from each other, and most games implement a similar trope of deaths only having importance if they happen in a cutscene. Which is incredibly lazy writing. It feels like I'm being told two different things because the game doesn't want to acknowledge its own mechanics. However, back to Dark Souls and most roguelikes, these games fully integrate death as a mechanic into the narrative. The entire story of Dark Souls is that every being in this world was granted immortality, which is why you and most of the enemies can resurrect. Sifu takes time to explain that the main character has a magical talisman that can resurrect them at the cost of rapid aging. Even something like Hades has all of the characters react to the fact that you're dying over and over again. These games bridge that gap between story and gameplay by having both connect to and acknowledge each other. The story is written with the knowledge that it is taking place inside a game, and the game mechanics are created to fit within the story. The two work together seamlessly and make the experience greater than the sum of its parts. You'll run into a boss in Hades and continue your conversation from the last run with them even making snide remarks about how you died last time. Dark Souls bosses all have motivations in relation to trying to kill an unkillable protagonist, and something like Death Stranding is a story about death and the consequences of it being missing in this world. The entire medium of game storytelling is one that uniquely takes place alongside mechanics and gameplay elements, and integrating those into the narrative is vital to telling a story that couldn't exist anywhere else. A story like Dark Souls could only be told through a video game, but the story of Borderlands 2 feels like a movie that's continually being interrupted with bits of gameplay, which is why they're literally turning it into a movie. Also, interesting fun fact, but they still have not released a trailer for the Borderlands movie, and it's supposed to come out this year, so I'm just gonna put out a hot take and say I think it's gonna be terrible. Just quote me on that if it ends up sucking. Now, part of the reason I made this video, like a lot of the ones I make, is that the discussion of this topic is pretty niche. While a lot of people might casually talk about failure and death mechanics in video games, I've rarely seen anyone investigate further and try to look into deeper problems and solutions regarding them. Now, this is partly due to the fact that anytime you look up failure state, the similarly worded failed state, which is some political thing I don't give a shit about, is the first thing that pops up. But regardless of that, I think this is something that we should be talking about more. Death and failure is an integral part of nearly every game, and I would hope that after watching this entire video, you'd see just how much of an impact it can have on them. I mean, most people can think of at least one or two games where even the mention of the mechanics is enough to blow their mind. You know, Assassin's Creed having you disconnect from the Animus, or Prince of Persia rewinding time when you died, Metal Gear Solid 3 using the fake death pill, or Returnal doing whatever the fuck that game was doing, I still don't know. And all of those games are only scratching the surface of what we can do with all this, yet most games still stick to the status quo. 
Most games have the character fall over, the screen fade to black, and a button prompt that reloads the last checkpoint. And hopefully, however many minutes into this video you are, you can see some of the problems with that. Games are always evolving and growing and maturing into better and more complex experiences, and so it's very strange to see every other part of them get better and better while failure states are still done the same way as Tetris all the way back in 1984. It just feels outdated. So while not every game needs to radically change to become a permadeath roguelike or a weird David Cage game, I do think that every game out there could better think about how they handle failure because changing just one simple mechanic could drastically improve the entire experience of many, many games. But anyways, that was the video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Ah, the fuck! Mission failed. We'll get up next time, you-